and we should get started. So hi, welcome to, I don't even know what day this is of the self-love revolution teaching. Um, this is my fourth third, fourth time in the, in the classroom, which I'm very grateful for. And as Mia said in the email that went out today, <clears throat> that I'm the only, the only man in the group teaching, which is a privilege and a, just a little bit of pressure. <laughs> so today's topic or the theme today in the classroom is, um, how was the way I wrote it? Your best relationship is the one in the mirror. Now I know I've talked about this in the classroom and I know that Mia has too about doing mirror work. But imagine you're gonna not talk about that except just to reference it. Um, in my work, I do a lot of work with, with mirror work as well. I have a self-love guided meditation on my website so people can get that. I'm not promoting it here. But what I'll talk about though is using the mirror as a feedback mechanism, which is gonna sound really strange in this moment, but let me explain what I mean. In, I remember how much talk it was I did this. I talked about in one of my talks about how we get um, the codependent piece, but how we get, we get propelled or reactive to what other people say about us. And what I wanna to speak to is how we can create a great um, ally with ourselves. In the work I've done over the years, and especially when I'm going through my, my psychology background, we talked about how to integrate parts of ourselves that are out of alignment. And in particular, we did some work where we basically admitted to ourselves that we had an array of voices inside, that we had parts of ourselves that would speak up every so often, and we didn't know what we were doing with those. And part of the education was how to create a almost a committee inside. Now, I mean, this may sound a bit out of whack to you, but let me trust as I explain what this means. What it meant really was to do was to create a team inside ourselves of who we are, because we have, as you may have discovered over the years of your life, more than one voice show up inside. Because there's the critical voice and there's the affirmative voice and there's the little child voice and there's the bossy voice and all these other voices we have inside. Because I, mean, I don't think I'm the only one doing this. We all do that. However, oftentimes we don't um, manage them. <laughs> Let's use another word for a second. We might try to suppress them or avoid them or ignore them but we don't learn how to, um, in a better word, enroll them, that's probably a better word to use. So part of what I'm gonna speak to is how we can create an alignment inside with all the different aspects of who we are. So we're on the same page and they're also building a, a team and, and even a, um, what was I looking for? Okay, like cheerleaders. I was, gonna, I was thinking of, for some reason I didn't think about football, American football, not English football, but American football about cheerleaders, having those voices inside be allied with us and be positive and focused on working with us. Um, sorry, just gonna do this, whoops. Okay, sorry, just make sure it was muted because someone was muted. Um, but also to, on the external point of view, and this is the reason I'm talking about using the mirror, is that when you have these voices inside, sometimes we forget who's like speaking inside and also who's looking through our eyes. And by using a mirror physically, so when you go by a shop window or you look in the mirror when you're driving the car or you look in the mirror in the bathroom or wherever you are, what you're doing there is you're connecting back through your eyes into your own eyes in the mirror, checking in and remembering who you are. Now, I'm going to break this down in more detail, but that's probably the summary of what I'm going to speak about. So I've given you the answer right now. So we complete and we can sign off. No, I want to give you some tips on this. For many of my clients and for many people I've known, and I did this myself in the past a lot more, I do it now, is when I would walk past the mirror or look in the mirror in the car or any of us look in the mirror, I would judge what I saw. I would be in a place where I didn't have a... Um, support system looking in the mirror and with the work I've done thankfully over many many years and what I pass on to my clients and to those people who are willing to listen to me <laughs> I talk about how it's important for us to use every resource to support ourselves in the teachings that I come from again with my master's degree mostly but also through the spiritual teaching I've been working with for the last 25 years 
the reminder is that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And being spiritual beings having a human experience, we're already divine, perfect, and whole. And then we get put into this world and, and, and put on a physical appearance, a, a body, a personality, a different thing that we, we wear that's unique while driving a car. And some of us look at that external representation as, th as thinking that's who we really are. And then we judge it because it doesn't look as good as somebody else's. Now, if now I grew up being, being a car lover, I didn't drive a lot of cars when I was very young, but I'd driven a lot of cars over the years. And I'll get in the habit of comparing my car against somebody else's, usually unfavorably. So I wouldn't necessarily be proud of my car. And I'm using that as an analogy because for many of us, we don't look at ourselves with any pride, like the, the, the way our face looks, the way our body looks. What I want to say about that, because it's a reminder to myself, is that we are all unique individual beings. All seven and a half billion people on the planet are all unique, which means nobody can be you better than you can. Nobody can be you better than you can. So to choose to look in the mirror with anything less than appreciation, anything less than encouragement, anything less than honoring is, is an error in approach. So how do we do this? So again, I do a lot of work with self-love in the mirror work, same as Mia does, same as other teachers in the room have done as well. But really what I'm speaking, speaking to is how you can start training yourself, a self-education, so to speak, to use that mirror as a cheerleading resource to support yourself. Now, this is going to be different, I know, because most people don't do this. But when you look at a mirror, and, and let, me, let me slide back for a second. For some people, this can feel challenging because it almost feels like being egotistical. And I'm definitely not speaking about that. Because egotistical is like, look at me, I'm better than everybody else. And that expression is an indication that somebody's not in their heart. That judgmental position is nothing about what I'm talking about here. What I'm speaking about is to, to look at yourself in the mirror and like, as one of my friends would say, like, you go, girl. That sort of encouraging phraseology, saying things that are positive. So it's not about comparing yourself against other people to say you're better than them, because it's not about that either. What it's saying, saying is when you do notice yourself in the mirror, when you do look at yourself with the reflection, you start to look at yourself with respect, with appreciation and with honoring. One of the reasons why I do the self-love teaching in my own, my own coaching and counseling is because it's the, it's the gateway. It's almost like a gateway drug to self-esteem, self self-support. But really what I'm working with is helping my clients because I'm, I, and by the way, I didn't choose myself. Let me back up a second. Hold that for a second, I'll come back to it. Um, hi, my name is Barry Selby. <laughs> Just jump right in, didn't think about it. I am a best-selling author, <laughs> love and relationship coach and an inspirational speaker. I'm also, <laughs> I'm the author of the best-selling book, 50 Ways to Love Your Lover. I'm also a passionate champion of the divine feminine. I didn't do any of this in the beginning. This is strange. Okay. I'm so familiar with this group. And in my work, what I started talking about recently is I'm really a relationship with self coach, more than just a relationship coach, because every time I work with my clients or every client I work with, the work I do with them is to help them love themselves enough so they start choosing better relationships out there. So in my work as a relationship coach, I don't work with couples, by the way, I work with singles. It's working with my clients. What I'm helping them do is really find their way back to loving themselves so much that they choose better quality relationships out in the world, be it business, love, or anything else. Okay, back into the process, because I realized I was, I, was, I was trying to explain something. I hadn't explained who I was and why I was doing this. So in the work with my clients, when I do the self-love practices, what I'm really doing is helping them navigate back to a place of honoring who they are. Because a lot of my clients have been through, and a lot of people in the world have been through, this codependent piece. And I talked about codependency um, two talks ago. It's in, it's in the self-love revolution group anyway. And that codependency piece, because we somehow think we're not whole and complete. Again, we somehow think we're not whole and complete. As I said earlier, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And being, hum being a spiritual being having a human experience, we are whole and complete because it's the way we were created. It's the way we come in. It's the way we are being. However, this world doesn't necessarily support that. 
or encourage that. So you may have been raised in a family or a dynamic where you weren't given um, encouraging feedback, where you weren't told or affirmed what you already knew were true. And so you may have started believing what was said to you from the outside versus what was happening inside. The reason why I use the mirror so much in my work is because in a lot of ways, what I want, want to get my clients to do is to tap back into who they originally were, excuse me, who they originally were and who I still are. We are whole and complete, regardless of our circumstance, regardless of our appearance, regardless of how we may have been told by our spouses, our parents, our coworkers, or anybody, we are whole and complete. And by the way, that does not mean your bank account has to be perfect. It does not mean your job has to be perfect. It does not mean your health has to be perfect. You are whole and complete internally. This journey we're on in the, in the human form, okay, we're going to go here, is a temporary journey. We are born, we go through life, and at some point we leave. Now, I'm saying that not to be depressing, but to say the reality is who we are, at least my belief system is, is not that. That's just part of our expression, part of our experience. Who we are is eternal, and who we are lasts, I believe, forever. So I feel that this journey on, in this physical form is a chance to play and explore and really understand who we are and why we're here. Those are two different things. Who we are, as I said, is eternal. Who we are, I believe, is beyond this physical form. But we inhabit these, as somebody likes to call them, meat sacks. You know, somebody has some really interesting terminology. I can't remember who said that. Who was who said that? One of my spiritual teachers said about how we, we basically, we, have, we, we wear these bodies. And it's a very, um, it's, it's, like putting on, it's like putting on a fancy dress that we wear these bodies for a period of you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years or less depending on your own lifespan. But it's only temporary. We get to choose this. And so when we look in the mirror and we look at that and we judge who we are, there's a real sense of insanity about that because we chose this. And yes, I'm, I know it sounds um, over-responsible to say this, but we chose our life we choose to live. I'm going down a path I didn't expect to, but so, so be it. So the challenge we have facing our life, and I've looked at this in my own experience, the opportunities, the challenges, the frustrations, the difficulties we go through, and I think Mia's talked about this too, and we can look at it and see the blessings in it. By going through this process, what we actually chose to do, let me, let me say it again, I'm saying it, I'm off track. So we come into this world, we come into this physical form, by choice. As spiritual beings, we see what the world is about and we choose to come in here. Um, there's a book I recommend, and a book by Neil Donna Walsh, not Conversation with God, but he wrote a book called The Little Soul and the Sun, which is a children's book that explains very simply what I mean here. Um, Someone coming back in again. Um, and so what happens is, make sure everyone wins. Excuse me a second, whilst I just. All right. Make sure I've muted. Got it. Okay. So, continuing. So, again, Neil Donald Walsh's book, Little Soul on the Sun, explains this very beautifully about how we as souls choose coming in on the planet. Now, this is my philosophy. It may not match yours, but I understand by being here, to get back to the point I was going to try to make, is that we choose what happens to us to a degree. We choose to explore certain qualities of experience of life, be it love or, or loss or caring, whatever that is. Independent of that, and as I was going down a path, which I want to come back to what I was starting with, independent of that, you get to remember all the way through what happens in your life, that you're already infinite, you're already whole, you're already complete, that what's happening here is a temporary moment meaning that if something bad is happening, this too shall pass, that famous quote, this too shall pass, because what's happening is not controlling you unless you let it control your feelings. So making yourself your best friend, using a mirror as your um, positive encouragement system, you will discover that you are actually 
more able to function in the world because you have this rallying point, which is your resource. looking in the mirror into your own eyes, seeing inside the truth of who you are, seeing the light that shines in there, by being in a self-reflective, um, self-supportive, and self-caring place, you will find yourself managing life's challenges and life's joys more easily, more successfully, more comfortably. Hang on one second, I'm just backing up a second. Uh, I didn't expect to go that path to get to get here but i guess that's what's coming through this morning and i want to be honest i want to honor the time and also honor yours your uh, participation let me just ask you these questions guys you know i realize i just threw a bunch of stuff at you right now I'll ask you if there's any questions you have if you have just unmute and, and let me know um because i have some other pieces but i wanted to make sure this piece which i jumped which was kind of massive makes sense to you Oh, this is Anne. It makes sense to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's what I need to know. Anybody else? Or I can move on to the next piece. Thank you, Carol, for that. Okay. That's that. I was wondering because I was just I, I was getting pulled in saying what I said. So I want to make sure that I, it was meaning to you because some people I talk to, they go, what does that mean? So how to do this? As I said earlier, we have many, well, let me say it this way. We have many reflective surfaces in our life, including car mirrors, bedroom, bathroom mirrors, windows in stores we walk by, and including also other people. We can choose to use people we trust in this context to get reflective feedback. So not only can you use the mirrors around you as check-ins, now, I don't necessarily mean you go up to the mirror and you actually talk to yourself in the mirror because that might make people, people might think you're strange. But I mean internally, <laughs> just to make this clear, internally you can speak to yourself in the mirror by just just saying like everything's okay or going to be good. You can be almost your, your own coach to encourage yourself and to honor yourself. But also you can, you can find trusted people you can rely upon, whether it's a coach like me or myself or it's somebody in your family, your spouse, or somebody else that is um, around you that is willing that you trust, that you're willing to trust to give you feedback that helps you. We don't, I believe, have enough people around us to encourage us. Generally speaking, most of us are, um, well, we're more, we're more surrounded by critics than by encouragers. And that's kind of unfortunately the way the planet's built to be. So to choose to find people in your life and to intentionally seek out family dynamic, excuse me, relationship dynamics, not always family, by the way, to encourage us. Um, that little piece came up for a reason. Oh, if you've ever read Richard Buck's book, Illusions, which is one of my favorite books of all time, he has several amazing quotes in the book. And one of the quotes he talks about is how members of the same family are very rarely born under the same roof. Meaning that you can choose your family that's not blood-based, but it's consciousness based. There can be your encouragers, there can be your team, there can be the people who you actually um, support each other. So they can be your mirrors as well. So the mirrors are not just physical flat surfaces that you look in and see yourself in. They're actually resources you have to keep yourself going because being on this planet can be, as one of my other teachers says, an interesting evolutionary experience. People say life is hell sometimes, I know. But I remember one of my teachers when I was doing some trainings in Canada, you said, how, what if you could look at every experience in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, as an interesting evolutionary experience? And I mean, that was in 2008. I'm still remembering it now. So that's been really fun. Seven, eight or seven, 2008. So for me, that was such a reminder that what happens in life isn't always bad. It's not always good. It's just what it is. So when we can handle our experiences and we choose our relationships intentionally so that we actually have positive resources, positive feedback, and positive um, reflections, that's the word we're looking for, then we can have more support in our lives. Because life doesn't have to be a slog. I used to tell my 13-year-old self that, because that was definitely something I felt back then. So our opportunity in life is to really focus on the good and to put more energy into being in a place where the good happens. 
And by using the mirror method, so to speak, by using the reflection of our um, relationship with ourselves, we can encourage ourselves. Another piece I'm going to put in there, which I don't think I talked about before. I'm, I'm, I'm also making sure I, I'm trying not to recap everything I've talked about the last four talks, three talks, is how we tend to, to um, approve or disapprove of ourselves when we judge ourselves for something we did or didn't do. So for example, and, and we may, I talked about this last time about the blame game and I was talking about blame, blame, shame, guilt, and resentment. I'm not gonna go into that piece, but the thing about judgment, which is the overarching piece, is that we tend to get in the habit of judging ourselves for things that didn't work the way we wanted to. We make a mistake or something didn't work out, or we didn't get the job or whatever that was, or, or um, the relationship didn't work out. And so we judge ourselves about that. That is a, a um, let's say, it's a relatively common experience for people because this planet is basically a place of judgment. Let me say it another way because I don't want to make it depressing, too depressing. The tendency for people on this planet is to judge, let's put it that way. However, it's not required. And, and in this, using the mirror piece, is you're creating a safe space within yourself where judgment doesn't have to be. Encouragement can be in its place. And so when you have experiences that put you in a place where you start to judge or you begin to go into that place where I'm going, where you're going, I can feel myself judging, you can stop yourself. <clears throat> and so you can shift your own inner, inner, gain, your inner um, conversation. <laughs> your inner narration, if you're like, I, I don't think I'm the only one that does this, but we, we tend to have an ongoing, um, <laughs> I'm careful I say this, I don't want to out myself too much. I sometimes feel like in my life, I've got a narrator inside this, 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 that's um, share, talking, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That, that's narrating my journey. But I'm aware of things in my life and I just notice myself so being the, being the witness, the observer of life, not just not being in the body, but being somewhere else, like one of those 17,000 parts inside myself, is watching life through another lens and just going, that's interesting. Oh, look at that. And is, and is witnessing. So that part can be your early warning system, so to speak. Because if you've got a tendency to fall into judgment by reflex or, or by, by automatic um, reaction, you can choose a different path because you have inside yourself very aware and I don't call it early warning, but, but responsive parts that can say, hang on a second, what can we do instead of judging? So my question to you to consider for yourself now or after the, after the, the talk is how can you, sorry, are you willing to let that part of yourself come forward to say, I can choose something, choose something different. By having that um, early warning system, and I'm thinking of a better word, it'll come to me in a minute. That a lot that, um, because trigger happy doesn't sound good either. But basically being an early warning system that catches your thoughts before you move into judgment. So you can choose something different. Because I've had an experience, I had an experience years ago with this and it's come up quite often recently in talking in the conversation, how the thing I wanted didn't happen and I got really bummed out about it, upset, distressed, frustrated. And then something happened afterwards that was better than what happened first. Like if I had got what I first wanted, I would end up worse off than what happened the second thing that showed up. It happened with a job opportunity. This is the first memory I have of it was I was, this is back in England when I was um, coming out of college. I turned down the first job because it wasn't, it felt, didn't feel right, even though it was really, it was a good paying job. But I ended up being the last person in the group to choose a good to get the last job offer, which was double the money. And it put me in, put me in a company that put me in Germany. I was, I was living in England at the time. Put me in a jump in in Germany that led me to end, end up me coming out to the United States. By taking that first job, I would have been working in a small company back in England and never would have done the work I've done, never would have taken the path I've taken. So the second chance, the failure, so to speak, after the opportunity was much better than the first choice. And I've had that, that experience unfold more than once over the years. And I've noticed it's one of my, 
um, touchstones is when something that I am holding out for, whether it's a job or a car or even a relationship that doesn't work, like they didn't happen, it, it was like taken away from me, so to speak, and something else shows up in its place a month, a week, three months later, I can pretty much guarantee for me, this is for me, maybe for you too, that what happened there is better than the first one. I have had, indefinitely with jobs, where a job I was going for didn't work out. The job I went for afterwards was much better than the first one was. So I'm saying that to say is that when you may get to a place where you might fall into judgment about something, bide your time. Because you might discover that what you thought was bad might actually be good afterwards. Because in this context, with the job failure, the job not working out, I was upset about the job thinking I'd missed out, I'd lost out, I wasn't doing well, I was failing. What I was being was spared. <laughs> spared from a job that would actually be more limiting for a job that's much better. And so translating the context into any situation that happens, recognizing that you have gifts coming that you don't even see yet, is that you can be less reactive to what happened because what's happening is maybe the thing that you thought was perfect wasn't, and it's been moved out of the way by some greater influence, spirit, force, whatever. So what you can actually have is better than that. So to, so what I'm trying to, to say with that is judge less, witness more. That's, um, for some reason, Hamilton came to my head there for the, the, the movie, the show. Um, judge less, witness more. That's not the quote, that's a different, that's a paraphrase of what they said in the movie. But that's the thing is that when you can be in a place where you use the mirror as a witnessing platform, a witnessing experience and be less unaware, be more aware, that's a better way of saying it, be more aware of what's happening and be a witness to your life, you might discover life becomes much easier. When we are caught up in the judgment, in the blame, and in the frustration, life tends to get crunchy and distressing and upsetting and uncomfortable. When we are in a place of witnessing, so we're not saying it's great, because I'm not saying we have to make everything look good when it's not, when you witness, which is neutral, what's happening in your life, you can then choose not to judge. You have to choose to just see, like it's almost, almost, almost like, um, like watching the river go by. If you see a, see, see, um, a feather floating in the river, you say, oh, that's cool, or well, that's bad, it's your choice. But what you're doing is witnessing it. It's the same thing looking at life and what happens in your life and the experience you have in life. Part of the encouragement I'm offering, being your own cheerleader and looking in the mirror and using that is to be a witness to life. So that when you're in circumstances that may not be the most comfortable ideal, rather than adding pain to that experience and judging and being upset and hurt feelings and resentment and blame and all that stuff, you can be a witness to it. You can bring yourself back to yourself and imagine in a way looking in the mirror and saying, I got this, it's okay. I can get through this. I will get through this. I've done it before and I will again. All those sort of phrases are reminders to yourself that you are greater than whatever's happening in your life. Okay. I said this was unscripted and I didn't know what was going to come through. So just, again, let me do a quick check-in. I just gave you another piece of the puzzle or another bunch of stuff. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions? I'm still with you. I find it very interesting. This is Anna. I'm following you very clearly. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that. Any questions, by the way, because I've, I've covered quite a bit of stuff. Any thoughts, questions you have? Um, um, you kind of covered it a little bit, but, you know, I mean, I've always asked myself, well, you know, if I chose this and all this stuff, and what, what, like, why in the world would I ever want to give myself suffering and all that other stuff, you know what I'm saying? Or all these agendas that I come up against that I have reactions to now, which are undesired like i wouldn't i prefer not to have it but i can appreciate i think part of what you said um and also in my own reflection i've thought to myself well you know if i was in my as you were saying if i was in my complete and whole state and i was in my let's say non-physical body up in heaven with with good source or whatever and i was um going to give myself a journey to go on then of course in that from that perspective i would give myself all these things that I'm experiencing now that as a human being, I'm thinking I would never choose that, but I would if I was a spirit or a soul 
with an agenda for a particular journey, knowing that I would come back to where I really was, which is my real true self. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, those are my thoughts and commentaries based on what you've stimulated my, my thoughts. Um, so I don't know, I guess I kind of answered my own question, but um, <laughs> what that, do you think about what I said? Well, well that's that why I reckon, sense? yes, it does make total sense. That's why I recommend again Neil Donald Walsh's book. It's a it's a it's a large format thin book called called this little, the Little Soul in the Sun. Um, the song, yeah, Little Soul in the Sun, and it's. Let me give you, I'll give you the the um, synopsis, the Cliff Notes version of the book. <clears throat> it's a very short book, but but the premise is is that um, this this soul is sitting up in heaven, what do you call it, in space or in in the universe, wherever it is, is looking. Um, I'm going to miss a lot of the story, but I'm giving you the, the cold points. He's looking down at the earth and is ready to come down and wants to come down and play on the earth and, and, and go on the earth. And this other soul, its best friend soul, so to speak, is sitting next to it. It's like, uh, I'm trying to remember as I say it, is what do you want to work on when you go down there? The key word being work on, or key phrase being work on. Because the souls are choosing to come on the planet to do stuff. Um, it's funny, now I'm, now I'm thinking of the movie Soul because I remember the visuals of that. But basically these, so, these, these um, souls are sitting there talking to each other. And the first soul says, well, I really want to work on, or I really want to work on forgiveness. That's what I want to work on this time. I've done all of those other things. I really want to forgiveness this time. It's like, okay, the other soul says, great, how can I help you? So, well, well, first one says, well, I want to go forgiveness, so I want to go through life and have something really amazing happen so that I can learn how to forgive. And the first soul says, excuse me, the second soul, soul says, well, however, if I can help you, let me know. I, mean, I, want to, I want to help you. you know, we're best friends. I want, to get, I want to help you on the, on the planet. And the first soul says, well, I need something really big to happen that's going to push me into a place where I have to forgive. Are you really willing to do that? And the second soul says, I love you so much. I will do what you need so you can come into forgiveness. And basically what they're setting up is that the first soul is going to have something so traumatic happen to it, because I don't know what gender it is, that the second soul is going to do something to the first soul that's so going to have that much of an experience that the first soul has to learn how to forgive for its lesson or its choice to work on this time around on the planet. Now, it's written much more, much more prosaically and, and, and wonderfully. It's a wonderful book. But that's kind of the essence of the story, meaning that now, this again, this is a philosophy you don't subscribe to, is what I believe is part of what we do, is that we, by coming into this physical experience, this temporary journey in the physical temporal world, we are going to have lessons that come up. Now, as a human, we may be looking at going, why the hell did I choose this? Now, I'm grateful for my life. It's been the way it's been. I mean, I know, especially lately, having this color skin has been a blessing. And I don't take that lightly. Um, but like choosing to be on the planet in certain places, certain parts of the world, certain physical experiences, maybe certain disabilities or skin colors or intelligences or religions or whatever that is, can look at it as being a very, it's not being a choice you would have wanted to make if you were so saying, I want to have the best fun. It's like, what if we come on the planet to choose lessons, opportunities to grow spiritually? to grow more whole. So when we go back to wherever we come from, we get to have more expansiveness, more freedom. I don't know if I'm saying that. It's like we're in spirit, we're always free and we're whole anyway. But the recognition is that sometimes we forget. So I'm sort of, sort of attempting to answer Anna's question here, but I hope this makes sense, is that what we're really talking about here is that everything that happens in our world as a human experience is something we can witness. I want to come back to the witness piece because this is a this is a, a a key to freedom for a lot of people. Is when we are not, as I talked about before, with codependency, we're not caught up in the fact where we're going to be reacted to what happens in the world. One of the most powerful things I've learned over the years for myself is not not that I don't judge because I do judge part of my part of what happens, but I'm better at catching it earlier now. I've had lots of years of getting more presence in that early warning system. I'd said I had where when I start to judge, you go, hang on, I need to go there. And I've started to become much better at witnessing things that happen, whether it's something as simple as burning something on the stove when I'm cooking, which I've done a couple of times recently, mistakes. 
rather than judging myself as being bad or really bit upset that I don't have anything to replace it with, I would just go, that was interesting. And I've actually had a couple of times where I laughed at it. That's the thing. When you can get to laughter, not necessarily in somebody's face because they may be upsetting you, you don't want to laugh at somebody, but you can laugh internally, just realize something that you just happened was like, oh, that was interesting. That you can find yourself being more free. Because the thing about this witnessing piece is when you can move into a witness presence by using, by looking in the mirror, by seeing yourself more clearly, you will be much more free on the planet, free emotionally, that is. Because being controlled by the people's, um, sorry, being, being reacted to other people's stuff, therefore being controlled by what people do or don't do around you is very limiting. And I said, I did think I did talk about this. One of the talks previously about codependency, about being governed by somebody else's expression. Like if somebody does something, we go, we, we, get, we get upset or we get upset feelings. That means we've given them puppet strings. We've given them control of our feelings so that they can upset us anytime they want. That's not fun. So when you become a witness to what's happening around you, when you become present to yourself and have this um, early warning field so that when things start to trigger you you're going to judge you can go I'm not going to do that i know better now then you become free so my um invitation to you is to to learn to practice to be willing to when things happen in your life is to just for a moment stop for a second if something happens again it could be anything in life that is triggering negatively is that for a moment just step back and go what do I really want to do with this? Do I want to be in reaction? Because maybe you want to be in reaction because it feels better. Don't recommend it because that's not ultimately a, a, a great feeling. Ultimately, it can be is depleting because when you get angry and upset, you're just venting out things that are negative and your body's not necessarily taking it well. So when you can witness things from a relaxed place, not a, not a can hold it together and not get upset, you're just going to be witness. But when you can really witness what's happening in life, and be a place where you are not choose, you are choosing to be um, observant to what's happening and available to something different. Then life can be different. As I mentioned with my job choices, when, it, when the second one showed up, it was like the, like, the, 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 like the other shoe dropped and went, oh, if I'd been, so if I'd been less attached to the first one, I would have a lot less emotional upset between then and now. The second job is so much better than what, what, the way my life turned out, I can definitely say, would have been a whole different path if I'd said yes to that first job versus the second job. So for me, being, being able to witness, that's one of the blessings that came through is I could see that very early on that don't necessarily get caught up with the first choice because something better may be coming along if you just simply step back and just witness it. So that's really the end of the teaching. This is really, I think that's the point about this, this making yourself relationship, relationship with yourself the priority is to be, become the witness to your life. No, it's a PS. <laughs> being the witness is really the first step. Well, it's the second step. First step is being aware. Second step is being a witness. The third step is then how to respond. Again, talked about this before, I believe. The difference between reaction and response is, is awareness. When you react to something that happens to you because it happened, you don't even think about it. It's like you react, you get upset. Somebody triggers you. It's almost like being poked and you just go, you just retaliate that's not awareness awareness is basically where something happens and you be, you choose to witness what's happening and then you choose to respond to it so for example um i live in la so cars cars are part of the culture if you get in a car accident one choice not necessarily a conscious choice is to get upset reaction jump out of the car start berating the driver um, raise hell on high water, be upset and, and totally be retaliating to the other person who, who you know, may suddenly crunch your car. The witness piece is not, is not um, what's the word? You come back to me. It is participatory. So when you are able to, sorry, I saw somebody come up with, uh, oh, Thank you, Carol, for letting me know. Carol to leave for her job. Timing, I guess. So being a witness to what happened. So the car accident happens, you're a witness to it, and then you choose to respond. So you get out of the car and you, start, you see the damage. Because, by the way, I had to teach myself this one. 
cars are just things. They're not our very life. <laughs> it's like to be very attached to my cars. You look at the car and you re- and you then you take care of the insurance, take care of the details, and you don't get upset. Not you don't. Hold, it's not like you contain or hold it back. But you're in a place where you're able to respond to what happened versus react to it. So this whole piece of learning how to be a witness enables you to choose how you want to respond from awareness versus react from lack of awareness. If you can navigate this piece alone, it will change your life. And that's what I'm inviting you to check, consider, and play with. Um, that was the piece I wanted to finish off with. So any questions or thoughts or things you want to offer before we start? Because this is really the end of my talk. I just realized that was it. That was the piece I want to give you. Well, that's beautiful. I really like that, Barry. Um, yeah, so like I was thinking, so um, like people talk about, well, fate, right? Like, you know, um, think whatever's going to happen is going to happen, those type of comments. So I, I've thought those things myself, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So it sounds like to me, and I, I, you, I just was explaining my, my thinking based on what you said in terms of what stimulated my thinking. And then I'd like to hear your comments on it. But so the little soul came down here, let's say myself in this case, and I had a mission before I came here. And then I'm down here. But it sounds like what you're saying is that it that that um that goal could be reached in many different ways. And by activating my witness consciousness, I can choose and I can select. And maybe one road will get me quicker to my goal than the other. I, I don't know. But so then does that mean then that um, fate, like whatever hap- whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen, then in a sense that doesn't seem to be true, or it could be true, I guess, if you believe it, then you create it for yourself. But the witness consciousness is allowing me to make decisions and having options. Whereas if I say um, whatever's going to happen is going to happen, then I'm not really witness conscious. I'm witness consciousing, but maybe without making choices and just saying whatever's happening is what needs to happen. Does that make sense to you? What I'm saying? I think so. What I, yeah, I, w- I would. I would say that what I'm what I was talking about with the, the, the little so- that the idea of the souls coming in is that that's not, that's not predestined, that's an intention. So we have free will and we have um, volition, definitely. So some lessons may show up in like 17 small pieces or one big one. And I would, I would suspect, and I'm, I'm reaching here because I don't know for sure, because I don't know, I don't know the, the, the rules of this, this, is what my conjecture is, is that if we have a lesson we want to learn this lifetime, that we chose before we came in. I, th- I believe we have freedom to choose how it happens. Not, not we can say we script it unless we're here, but we can, uh, we can, because we have freedom to choose and life happens, we're not robots and it's not uh, fate all the time, is that we, we can make different choices. And in fact, we can choose during this lifetime not to do the lesson because we may discover, or we may choose a life where the big, the big lesson that someone wants to learn doesn't become part of our life so i want to make sure you, you um um i want to make sure we get clear that the soul doesn't have governance over how we express on the planet for the whole life it's part of who we are because we are souls having human experience as i said or spiritual beings having human experience so we get to witness and and explore life here on the planet and if it coincides with what we've intended as souls i'm realizing i may be going back on what i said by saying it this way but i believe we have freedom to choose on the planet for i'm to say we're free will we have volition that we can make choices but at the same time a lot of things that we want to go through in life we learn early on so a lot of times i believe the lessons we're meant to learn from spirit happen early on and that we spend the rest of our life trying to fix that in some ways because we have the, because the lesson isn't always to suffer the lesson is to transform so like forgiveness is not we're not supposed to go through life going through judgment is we want to become more whole by forgiving. So for a lot of us and for my own life, for a lot of my clients, healing, for example, um, issues from family when we're young, whether it was abuse or neglect or one of those things, becomes a powerful lesson that once we've learned it, we're free to enjoy the rest of our lives. That may be the lesson the soul was looking to have, was to have the, the, level, the lesson of freedom and healing and forgiveness and wholeness. And the choice that it went through was to have a family dynamic that gave it the challenges to get through to get there, perhaps. So, when I'm sort of just to say what to come, what I said before about the little soul, that book, 
the idea of that premise is not that the whole life is dedicated, it's that one lesson. It's part of what life is going to be about, I would say. So there's a lot more than, there's a lot more goodness happening. Let me say that. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I, I think I, well, I like everything that you said today because what it does, it gives me um, the understanding that um, I am, you know, there's, a, there's, it's all good then, so to speak, you know, like, yeah. um, you know, there, it's, there's no, there are no mistakes and there's nothing that's bad. And I have opportunities to participate in my outcomes. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just a, a little kind of a, an experience, a journey that we're all on. But, you know, the good news is that we've come from wholeness and greatness and we will return there. So I like that. Thank you for that hope. Absolutely. And also, we are, as I said, spiritual beings have a human experience. <clears throat> and the longest relationship we have whilst we're here with ourselves. So why not treat yourself with care, compassion, loving, support, and love? So that, that to me, is, is that's always the underlying message I teach in my work and my coaching as well, is that, that, that any relationship we have out there is always temporary compared with the one we have with ourselves because we, you know, we come in with it and we leave with it. So why not make it the most... Um, positive relationship you can have so i mean if anybody else has anything to say please do speak up you know it's okay <laughs> fine no problem in the absence that anybody else doesn't say anything i was wondering if you could what your thoughts were about how incarnation and having multiple lives lives lifetimes plays into what you've been talking about today oh, we're getting into that territory now are we okay so i'm going to speak from my own experience because i don't have a philosophy about how well, I believe, I believe this is the place more than I have. I've had past life experiences. I've had out of body experiences when I was younger and actually had some pretty profound recognitions of things that happened that I participated in centuries ago. Like I remember, I remember a, a time, I'm not going to put it on the, the video because it's not relevant here, but I've had enough experiences to know that I believe that's one reason why I'm very convinced that we're spiritual beings having a human experience and that we, we come through more than one lifetime. So, um, Oh, Gary Zukov has a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. That's a book I think that talks about that too. But personally, I believe that we definitely, um, I'm not, I'm not a, um, what's the, I don't know what the term is. Uh, was it, re I think it's called a, re a realist. It was um, Albert Ellis is a, one of the people I studied when I was in my master program who basically, believe, he, he said basically that when you're dead, you're dead. That was his philosophy basically. It's like life is here. You're born, then you die, and that's it. Nothing else. I don't subscribe to that. I'm a very firm believer that we're, that we were we we pre we pre exist our life, and we post exist our life as well. Who we are is not this physical being. We just inhabit it. Like as I said, somebody um, a while ago, I remember someone was joking about how you know we just we're basically driving around these in these meat sacks. Although it's another philosophy is just say it more um, poetically is that every atom in our body comes from somewhere in space and stars. So we're basically filled with stars, which sounds even more poetic. But the reality is, I believe that we are, um, we incarnate the planet in different forms, different lifetimes, and we leave at some point too. I don't, beyond that, I'm not, I'm not gonna get too deep with that's a whole different philosophy of the teaching, but I'm very much of the belief that um, there's more to life than just the physical experience. That I do know. And from some experiences I've had in retreats and in meditations, I know there's more to life than just this three-dimensional experience. That much I'm very clear about too. So I stand on that. Thank you for sharing that. I like that. Thank you so much. I, I'm in agreement with you. That's my experience and my perspective as well. Good. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> so any other questions, Philippa, Nanda, or Anne, if you have any questions, if not, I'm going to wrap this up and complete as we're getting to the, towards the top of the hour. Um, I'm not seeing any comments, responses. So to summarize, um, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to my website. Oh, yes. Philippa. What is the most educated, spiritual, compassionate thing you can say to a body shamer that brings you peace? Just witness it. Do you have affirmation for this? Um, so body shamer meaning somebody shames their own body, I'm guessing is what you're saying. Uh, um, I would say, if that's what you're talking about, I would say that somebody who shames their own body has been trained by somebody else. 
that uh, nine times out of ten, my from what I've witnessed and seen, people who judge shame their own bodies were raised by somebody who did that to them when they were younger, or who's by somebody who did it themselves, and then they, like their mother or their father, and then they copied it. So that habit. Uh, let me finish off this thought for somebody who may, who may have got that and come back to what you said, you said that somebody else shames, some, shames others. Um, that habit, though, can be retrained because it is a habit. It can be broken, can be transformed, can be changed. And moving back to the question you said about when someone shames others, um, simply put, the best thing to do is remove yourself. If you're, if you're being shamed by somebody else, if you're the person being shamed, um, you don't have to stay there. It doesn't matter what the relationship is, family, marriage, whatever that is. You can choose something else. Now, if that person is attached to judging and will not shift off of that, and they're not willing to get help, you can't control them. You can't change them. So the only thing you can do is with yourself. So if somebody, if you are the recipient of somebody body shaming you, first of all, yes, witness, as I said earlier, and be compassionate with yourself. Recognizing what they're saying is their perception, not your truth. We say that one again because it's the most important piece. What they're, what they're saying is their perception, not your truth. When somebody judges who you are, how you look, what you're about, that is their limited viewpoint of what they think. It's not the truth. This is the thing with codependency is when we believe what other people say about us, that's when we fall into codependency. When we believe who we are based upon our own experience of ourselves and we watch other people's opinions and recognize that's all it is, is their opinions, because that's the witnessing piece, we become free. So that, that's, the clip, that's the short version. If you want to go deeper, you can reach out to me, we can talk. But this is, this is the recognition I want to make sure you get is that if somebody is judging, blaming, shaming you, that's their opinion, not your reality. So that's that's the Cliff Notes answer. Hope that's helped for you, Philippa. Any other any other questions, thoughts? Before I sign up, we're at the top of the hour, and I'll make sure I cover any last points. Hope they helped. Um, so again, relationship with self is the most for me the most. You're welcome, Philippa. From, for me, it's the most, most potent piece is to really develop the healthy relationship with self. 90% of that is recognizing that you're okay. Because what you're really um, doing is recognizing who you really are. Being a witness to yourself, being available to yourself, and to not, sorry, and to hold your own self value above what other people think of you is freedom. And that's the healthy strategy of all. So with that, um, you're welcome, Anne. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Philippa. Thank you, Nan, for being here. Um, this replay will be available in the group. I know later on I'll be posting, I'll be sending uh, Mia the link when it's complete. And uh, thank you for playing along, Anna, for, and thank you, Philippa and Anna, for your questions and thoughts. I appreciate you participating as well. And uh, my, by the way, my website is my name, so if you want to find out more about me, my old 90s-looking website, which is barryselby.com, is available for you. Any questions, thoughts, want to reach out to me, get some help. Um, and you can post questions below this, by the way. If you're watching the video in replay, you can post questions in the group, and I'll answer there as well. And uh, with that, I thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves always. It's my, my, my passion is to help have my clients and have my friends remind them to please take care of yourself, which means in this case, really become friends with yourself. To hold to be a space, take care of yourself, and appreciate who you really are because you are amazing. You are a divine spirit having human experience. Honor that as who you are. With that, I thank you for watching. I will see you maybe another time in the group. I'll be, I'm in the group as well as one of the admins. So if you have any questions, you can message me there as well. And uh, thank you for being here. And again, take care of yourself. All right. And Susan, any last questions, comments, questions, all good. Thank you. And with that, I thank you. And I'll see you again soon. As you said, Andy, ciao. Bye.